السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Dear viewers everywhere Welcome to another live edition of your program Gardens of the Pious By the grace of Allah Today's episode is an episode number 243 and we're still in chapter number 23 which is known as superiority of the poor weak and unrenowned muslims and that is going to be the third episode insha'Allah explained in this chapter without any further ado the hadith which we'll begin with is hadith number 255 in the series of Riyadh al-Salihin or gardens of the pious and this hadith is narrated by Abu Hurairah رضي الله عنه عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إنه ليأتي الرجل السمين العظيم يوم القيامة لا يزن عند الله جناح بعوضة متفق عليه in this sound hadith, which is agreed upon its authenticity, the great companion Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, on the day of judgment, there will be brought a bulky person, a huge person, a muscular person, whose value before Allah will be less than that of the wing of a mosquito. This is a very interesting hadith. It shows us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not evaluate people based on their look or their fitness or their bodies. Rather, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in another hadith, إن الله لا ينظر إلى صوركم ولا إلى أجسامكم ولكن ينظر إلى صدوركم Allah does not evaluate you by simply looking at your bodies or your images some people they have nice look nice images very photogenic and some people dress up nicely their outfit may cost thousands all name brands Special designers, but inside is bad. Their hearts are not good. Maybe he is wearing a pen worth a couple thousand, and a watch, tens of thousands, eyeglasses, a couple thousands, pair of shoes, thousands, socks, thousands. But all of that before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means literally nothing. Allah the Almighty ordered us in the Quran in Surah Al-A'raf خُذُوا زِينَتَكُمْ عِنْدَ كُلِّ مَسْجِدْ وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُسْرِفِينَ Allah is beautiful. He is the most beautiful. And He likes beauty. He likes a person to look nice, to appear nice, to dress up nice and clean and neat, especially if he's going to the place of worship to the masjid. But without being extravagant, while being moderate, and without showing off, and without feeling pride in his heart that he may be superior to others. Jabala ibn al Ayham, a Christian king, heard about Islam during the time of Umar ibn Khattab when he was the Khalifa. He liked it. 
he was given da'wah, he accepted Islam, and he came to perform tawaf around the Kaaba. And accidentally, an ordinary Muslim, one of those many people perceived him as inferior. You see, when you perform tawaf as of today, you find princes, rulers, leaders, and you find ordinary workers. All are performing tawaf, doing the same procedures, undertaking the same journey. And only Allah knows whose tawaf is accepted and whose umrah is accepted. Titles are being removed. You take them off as you take your shoes off before entering the masjid. But this man, sinful man, accidentally stepped on his nice outer garment. So he slapped him. He slapped him over the face. He treated him as a slave. Does not understand that in the Muslim ummah, there is no difference before Allah and before the court of justice in Islam between rich and poor, between the ruler and those who are being ruled. This is a theory and this is how it should be. So he presented his case before Umar ibn al-Khattab. May Allah be pleased with him. He investigated the case. He did not say, this guy is a king. This guy is a new Muslim. Should take it easy with him. It will be a big loss if we offend him. He said, ya Jabala. Did he slap this poor man over his face? He said, lying is a shame. Of course I did. He said, and why did you? He said, this poor person stepped on my garment. So he ordered that he should slap him back as equality and punishment. He refused. He said, it's not up to you. This is the justice in Islam. He said, let me think about it. Then he slipped away. He ran back to his country and he upstated from Islam. Did the Muslim Ummah lose a big deal? Not, not even a little deal. If you accept Islam, it's for your own self. In Surah Al-Hujurat, some people who accepted Islam used to come to the Prophet wasallam, remind him as counting their Islam as a favor that they have conferred upon the Prophet. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confronted them in ayah number 18 of Surah Al-Hujurat saying, يَمُنُّونَ عَلَيْكَ أَنْ أَسْلَمُوا قُلْ لَا تَمُنُّوا عَلَيَّ إِسْلَامَكُمْ بَلِ اللَّهُ يَمُنُّوا عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ هَدَاكُمْ لِلْإِيمَانِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Ayah number 17 <coughs> of Surah Al-Hujurat. They count their accepting Islam as a favor that they've done to you. Say, O Muhammad, do not count your Islam as a favor that you've done to me. Rather, Allah alaykum. It is Allah who conferred his favor upon you by guiding you to faith if you truly believe, if you were true in your faith. So now because the person is rich, we twist the rules. And if he's poor, we throw the book at him. This is not Islam. I perfectly understand while I'm sitting before the cameras and you guys are watching, many people are sitting somewhere and saying, but this is not happening today. We work with Muslim employers in many rich countries. Simply because we are poor, we're being treated as slaves. Number one, we cannot generalize, and you all agree to that. There are many people who are super nice, and they treat their servants as they treat themselves. And Allah is my witness. I have been invited by some of these people who are multi-billionaires. And when they sit on the food, they invite the driver, they invite their workers, they invite their servants, and they eat. They give them to eat from whatever they eat. This is what I have seen by my own eyes. This is what the Prophet ﷺ ordered. But there are some people who are outlaw. Some people who are arrogant. They have pride, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns such people. Again, is his arrogance. It can hinder them from entering paradise. You never know, maybe this person whom you treat as inferior to you, 
before Allah is much better than you. So look at this. In this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says on the Day of Judgment, the man who is physically fit, who is huge and muscular, may not even wait the weight of a wing of a mosquito. Not even the mosquito. If we notice that the mosquito was mentioned in many examples, it was mentioned in Surah Al-Hajj. It was mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah the Almighty says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَحْيِي أَنْ يَضْرِبَ مَثَلًا مَا بَعُوضَةً فَمَا فَوْقَهَا Allah is not shy to give a parable, an example of a mosquito or anything above that. A mosquito is created by Allah. Lesser than the mosquito is created by Allah. Some people inquired about the mosquito. And why did Allah create al baud the mosquitoes? Why did Allah create them? Very beautiful reply from one of our predecessors was to humiliate the arrogant ones. Look what Allah says in Surah Al-Hajj. ضُرِبَ مَثَلٌ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ those whom you worship instead of Allah, they cannot afford anything. They cannot even create a mosquito. Even if all of them put their efforts together, their science, their intelligence to create a fly. Nowadays, we have planes that are being flown without pilots. Drones. We have recently cars can be driven with an auto driver. You can sit and relax, and there is an auto driver can take you around. You give them a command. With all of that, can we create a mosquito? Can anyone create a living creature other than Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? No. We'll continue with this, inshallah, after this call. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Abu Safwan, welcome to Gardens of the Pious. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Wa alaikum, Assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The first thing is, Sheikh, yesterday I read the, uh, this week, uh, your um, message. So, first, my question is, how is your mother? May Allah give her shafa and complete Amen. and uh, speedy you know, cure. Uh, may Allah accept our grace. Amen. Amen. So, Jazakallahu khayra. And the other thing is, uh, Sheikh, uh, right now I'm calling you from hospital. So my surgery is in the morning for my knee replacement. So I request you to ask the viewers to pray for my successful, you know, this surgery. So uh, this is my re May another Allah request. May Allah the Almighty uh, give you all yes. shifa and quick recovery, Ya Rabbi. Okay. Allahumma rabba nas okay, and Okay, that's my... Amin, Amin, Samu Amin. And my question is... Go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Inshallah, inshallah. My question is, uh, Sheikh, uh, about this, you know, if you have some mistake, you know, while doing Umrah, so you have to give this dumb, and uh, you have to give a slaughter, you know, this. So do you supposed to be there, or you can ask somebody to do it, give it? <laughs> like my brother, he is in Haram. So I can ask him to do it there, or I, I supposed to be there personally? Uh, Abu Safwan, could you specify... The fault or the error that you made during Umrah, which you think that it requires a fidya? Yes, actually, I asked this question already with you. You said you have to redo the Umrah, so I performed Umrah, but I didn't have time to slaughter this goat over there. So, uh, because there was no time because of my flight, okay. and another issue. I, first I forgot. So, I asked my brother to do it. So, then okay. I uh, said, okay, do I supposed to be there personally, or anyone can do on my behalf? Jazakallah. No. As a matter of fact, you don't have to be there. You can do al-wikala, but it must be done <coughs> in Mecca. So if you have somebody whom you trust who can offer the fidya and it should be distributed entirely among the poor people in Mecca, that should be sufficient, inshallah. The reason why I asked him, can you specify what was the fault? Because there is a very large volume of Muslims who perform umrah or hajj. They assume that I may have done a mistake, so I should offer a fidya. And subhanallah, vast majority of Muslims are poor. Vast majority of Muslims cannot even afford the hajj during hajj. So instead of burdening them, we ask. 
even if they are rich. We ask them, what was the error? Somebody says, by mistake, I clip a nail, a fingernail. We say, khalas. He said, it's by mistake. There is no blame on you. You don't have to offer anything. You just say, astaghfirullah. By mistake, I put in my clothes or my underwear. By mistake, I wore some perfume. You wash it off and you say, astaghfirullah. And there is no fidya in this regard. That's why I like normally to precede the answer to such question by asking, what was the error whom you assume that it requires fidya? Barakallahu feekum. I highly recommend to my dear viewers, for you and for those whom you know that they are about to perform Umrah or Hajj, to watch our program, Hajj step by step. It's better to learn about everything concerning the journey that you're about to undertake, rather than going and figuring out that you made some mistakes, and you feel sorry that because you have to give fidya, and you're afraid that your Hajj or Umrah will not complete. Barakallah fiqum. So the ayah of Surah Al-Hajj concerning Al-Ba'ud that those whom you invoke instead of Allah and you ask for help cannot create zubaban mosquitoes, flies not even if they all put their efforts together not only that look at the challenge وَإِنْ يَسْلُبُهُمُ الزُّبَابُ شَيْئًا لَا يَسْتَنْقِذُوهُ مِنْهِ ضعف الطالب والمطلوب And if the flies take anything of their food or drink, and it happens, even in five-star hotels, all of a sudden you find there is a fly. Maybe because the food is very delicious, because of the smell, they did not spray insecticide today, or because of a reason or another, you find a fly on your food, or on your drink, or on the sweet. What do you do? You hush it off. And before you did so, it managed to take a bite from your food, or a sip of your drink. Can you take it back? Can anyone extract? The little bit of food or drink was taken by a fly or a mosquito or an insect. Can you take it back? No way. وَإِنْ يَسْلُبُهُمُ الزُّبَابُ شَيْئًا لَا يَسْتَنْقِذُهُمًا ضَعُفَ الطَّالِبُ وَالْمَطْلُوبُ Both are weak. The one who's chasing the fly and the one who's being chased, which is the fly itself. We all perceive flies and mosquitoes are weak. As weak, they are weak. And those who are trying to chase them to hish them off, or to kick them out, or to kill them, they are as weak before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What makes any human being valuable, what makes any human being respected and honored, is belief. Belief in Allah, monotheism, then righteousness. If this person is righteous, even if he's that little, even if he's so small and tiny, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, is a perfect example to give in this regard. He was a short and petite companion. Once when the Prophet sallallahu was sitting with his companions, he volunteered to grab some dates from a date palm tree, climbing this huge date palm tree. As he was climbing, his shins were uncovered. The companions looked at how slim were his uh, legs and scrutiny, they laughed. So the Prophet ﷺ said, مِمَّا تَضْحَكُونَ Why are you laughing at? You're laughing at his legs because they're so skinny? By Allah, his legs before Allah are heavier than the mountain of Uhud, subhanAllah. So a man who's very petite and small, because of his righteousness, only his legs heavier in what sense? Heaviness in what sense? Look, Allah does not weigh us based on the weight of our bodies. What is being weighed for you and for me and for every person is the deeds. The ayah says, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا 
وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَى Whoever does an atom weight of good shall see it. Whoever does an atom weight of bad shall see it. And in Surah Al-Qari'ah, Allah the Almighty says, فَأَمَّا مَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ If the person's deeds are heavy, not his weight, not his flesh, not his bones, how much you have been eating to grow this body. What really matters is the deeds. فَأَمَّا مَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ The scales of his good deeds are heavy. Then he will be in a pleasant life in paradise. وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ But if the person's deeds were light, now again his weight, his body, just his deeds, فَأُمُّهُ هَاوِيَةً His abode will be far of hell. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. In Surah Al-Anbiya, <coughs> in ayah number 47, Allah the Almighty says, وَنَضَعُ الْمَوَازِينَ الْقِسْطَ لِيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ فَلَا تُظْلَمُ نَفْسٌ شَيْئًا وَإِنْ كَانَ مِثْقَالَ حَبَّةٍ مِّنْ خَرْدَلٍ أَتَيْنَا بِهَا وَكَفَى بِنَا حَاسِبِينَ The scales of justice will be put up on the day of judgment. No one will be wrong and art to the extent that if there is even as little as a mustard seed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring it in the scale. If you've done any good deed, and similarly, any bad deed, it will be present, smiling, it will be there. Helping somebody to cross the road, it will be there. And look at this. You look at somebody who's been defected or deformed, and you winked at him. Or within yourself, you mocked at him. That's a bad deed. أَتَيْنَا بِهَا We shall bring it وَكَفَى بِنَا حَاسِبِينَ May Allah the Almighty guide us to what is best and fix our hearts to please Him. Ameen. We'll take a short break and we'll be back inshaAllah in a couple minutes. Please stay tuned. Rasulallah, Habiballah Rasulallah, Habiballah Welcome again from me, from your host, Ismail Bullock, and from your host, Gabriel Romani. The parents have to encourage their kids to get married, and at the same time, support them. Yes. What many people don't understand is that seeking knowledge in itself is ibadah. Mm. And Abu Hurairah ta'ala anhu says, لَأَنْ أَطْلُبُ الْعِلْمَ سَاعَةً أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ أَلْفِ رَكَعَةً That I seek knowledge for an hour is better and more beloved than Alf raka'ah, which means a thousand raka'ah. The real meaning of la ilaha illallah is not there's no God but God. La ma'abud bi haqqin illallah. That is, if you want to note it down, that is the real meaning of la ilaha illallah. There is none worthy of worship except Allah. I remember as, as, as a Christian, when I was a Christian before, you know, they have this whole issue of, 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 you know, your cross. You know, you have to wear your cross. This will protect you. And if it breaks, you know, something wrong will happen to you. And, you know, the icons and, you know, put an icon in your wallet. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk on your favorite channel, Huda TV. I'm your host, Arkham Rashid. They actually did uh, such and such that you're accusing him of in your mind. Uh, so now I want to start off with my right hand side, uh, Brother Ahmed. If you can just tell us what your thoughts were on that video, what can you extract from that video? Go ahead. Would you say some of the youth uh, turn to drugs, especially you know in your country, if 
if they don't have jobs or you know it's because they want to get away from their daily normal lives would you say that's okay, a reason absolutely that? that's true some yes. people just resort to drug as the last option because they they get themselves straight out and they're instead of depression but they don't know where to turn for help what's the wisdom behind islam prohibiting drugs uh, islam you know as a matter of fact mm -hmm. you know all the islamic rulings in general they are just prescribed for preserving two main things the religion mm -hmm. which is spirituality and the worldly or the mundane things which is you know the, the soul human soul so i think um, a message would be just to stay completely away, away from, from it. it even we can say oh look it's haram Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. We were talking before the break about what is being weighed and we confirm it is not the bodies, rather it is the actions whether good or bad. Take for instance in the beautiful hadith which all of you already know in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said there are two words, these two words are very dear to Ar-Rahman Habibatani Ar-Rahman they happen to be very light on one's tongue to say them very easy, very beautiful and these two words are very easy to say and repeat ثَقِيلَتَانِ فِي الْمِزَانِ they weigh a lot, they are very heavy in the scale. So, at the same time, they are light, but on the one's tongue. And heavy in the scale of what? Of the good deeds. These two words is when you say, Subhanallah wa bihamdah, glory be to Allah and praise be to Him. Subhanallah al azim, glory be to Allah the Great. How, how easy is it to say, Subhanallah wa bihamdah? Subhanallah al azim very easy. See, but in the scale of the good deeds, they weigh very heavy. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever says in the morning 100 times, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, Subhanallah al azim And in the evening, likewise, no one shall come on the day of judgment with better deeds than him. Allah loves these two words so much. Praising and glorifying Allah by these two words. Subhanallah wa bihamdih. Subhanallah al azim. If you say it 100 times in the morning, if you say it 100 times in the evening, no one on the day of judgment will come with better deeds than you. Except somebody heard this hadith, so he kept saying it, and he added another 10, 110, 115, 150. The greater, the more is the greater the reward. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Maryam from the case. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Maryam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, how are you? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. Uh, uh, Sheikh, how's your mother now? Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, just make dua for her. Thank you so much. Uh, Ameen. Uh, give Sheikh your mother. Allahumma amin. Ameen. 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 Uh, Sheikh, uh, I, I plan to... I plan to... To make um uh, make umrah and hajj yeah. with my cousin. With my cousin, uh, can be, but my cousin she still not yet Muslim. She's not it's Muslim. Okay, no problem. Oh, you said she's not Muslim yet. Yeah, not yet, my cousin. So how could she perform umrah if she's not Muslim? Ah, uh, she not allowed yet. Okay. Cannot be? No, oh, okay. no. Thank you very no. much. It is not Thank permissible. You. Yes, Sister Maryam. It is not permissible for other than Muslims to enter the Haram. And the Haram is not only the Kaaba or Al Masjid al Haram. There is a huge sanctuary. Allah stated in, stated in the Quran in Surah Al Tawbah Inna al Mushrikuna Najasun, Fala Yakarabul Masjid al Harama Bad Ami Mada. I read this is ayah number 28 of chapter number 9. 
So it is not permissible for other than Muslims to enter the sanctuary of Mecca or Al Medina. Insha'Allah, when she accepts Islam, uh, she will be more than welcome to perform Umrah and Hajj. Thank you, and may Allah help you to guide her to the true deen, and may Allah reward you for that. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for her to be rightly guided and to accept the Islam. Amen. Look at this beautiful ayah of Surah An-Nahl, ayah number 97, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَ وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَلَنُحْيِيَنَّهُ حَيَاةً طَيِّبَةً وَلَنَجِزِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْرَهُمْ بِأَحْسَنِ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Very beautiful. Which means, whosoever does good righteous deeds, whether a male or a female. So now we said the way means nothing. The size means nothing. Also the gender means nothing when it comes to judging the person before Allah, whoever does good deeds, whether male or a female, as long as he or she is a believer. The reward is the same. We shall reward them in this dunya to live a happy and a good life. And in the hereafter, we shall reward them according to the best of what they use to do. These are all informations and evidences that confirm that it is not the lifestyle that you live in which will determine your lifestyle afterward. Rich must be rich there, and poor gonna be poor and inferior there, have nothing to do with that. It is what you have been building up of assets towards your hereafter. What will benefit you? Not the house which you're building on a private lake here. This is transient. And this is not lasting. Rather, it is the house which you're building for yourself. Allah is building for you. If you're one of those who would observe the 12 emphatic rak'ahs, the sunan, before and after some prayers on a daily basis. Even if you are the poorest person on earth, these ahadith teach brothers and sisters, never, ever look down at any person because you never know. Maybe the person whom you think because he's a janitor or a trash man. He was not fortunate in this dunya to be a doctor or to have a nice house in Beverly Hills. But before Allah, he will be in a better place. Rather, we should be judgmental of our own selves, of our own actions, of our own deeds, than keeping ourselves busy with looking at others and judging their actions or judging them based on their look or their capacity and financial situation in this dunya. And now, with another fascinating hadith, one of the most beautiful hadith. And I will try to control my tears as much as I can, because this hadith is really impressing. This hadith is narrated also by Abu Huraira radiallahu <coughs> And it is hadith number 256 in the series. Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu rawa anna mra'atan sawda'a kanat taqummu al-masjida aw shabban fafaqadaha aw faqadahu rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fasa'ala anha aw anhu faqalu mata قال أفلا كنتم آذنتموني فكأنهم صغروا أمرها أو أمره فقال دلوني على قبره فدلوه فصلى عليها ثم قال إن هذه القبور مملوءة ظلمة على أهلها وإن الله تعالى ينورها لهم بصلاتي عليهم Muttafaqun alayhi. The great companion Abu Huraira radiyallahu an narrated that <coughs> there was a black woman or a young man who used to clean the masjid at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then once the Prophet peace be upon him missed her and he asked about her or him. He was told that she or he had died 
So the Prophet ﷺ said, why didn't you inform me? It seemed as if the companions considered the matter insignificant. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, دلوني على قبرها show me her grave or his grave when it was shown to him he offered salat al janaza the funeral prayer sallallahu alayhi wasallam he offered the prayer over her <coughs> then he said sallallahu alayhi wasallam these graves cover those in them with darkness and allah illuminates them for its dwellers as a result of my supplication for them. The hadith is collected by both Al-Bukhari and Muslim. As I said, this hadith is really fascinating. We want to know Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how he was mercy to all the creatures. Look at this hadith as one of the great references in this regard. But let's take this call first. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Um Fatima from the case says, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have two questions. Yeah, go ahead, sister. First question is Why does the soul of a pious believer after death? It is within the body in Barzakh. Or in heavens or paradise. Okay. <clears throat> second question. And second question is: uh, death is a gift. Uh, death is gift for a believer. Can you please explain? Death is a gift for the believer. For a believer. Okay. Uh, can you please explain it? Okay. Wajazakum. <coughs> There are different stages that take place to the soul whenever the person expires. The first stage is when the soul is extracted from his or her body, whether they are believers or non-believers. Then there are two sets of angels. The angels of mercy would take the soul of the believer and would ascend immediately without any delay. Then they will cross from one heaven to another until they reach to the seventh. Then Allah the Almighty is pleased with the soul and he will order the angels, اكتبوا روح عبدي في عليين. اكتبوا روح عبدي في عليين. Write the soul of my servant in the record of those who will be saved. As explained in Surah Al-Mutafifin, there are two records. عليين and سجين. عليين of the high of those who will be saved. Then... will order the soul to be sent back to earth and he will say مِنْهَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ وَفِيهَا نُعِيدُكُمْ وَمِنْهَا نُخْرِجُكُمْ تَارَةً أُخْرَى This is what Allah decided. He created us from earth and he will revive us from earth. مِنْهَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ وَفِيهَا نُعِيدُكُمْ And you shall be returned to earth and you shall be resurrected again from earth. So when the soul will be instilled in the body, this is the second stage. The soul will come back to the body. Where the person will be questioned. And if he managed to answer the question, he will see his place in heaven and he will be in the light. <coughs> Excuse me. So long as he is in Al-Barzakh. Al-Barzakh means the transient life between this life and the hereafter. We know very little about this life. We know that the souls will be either in delight because of being able to see their seats in heaven or in misery because of being able to see their seats in heaven. When the body is decomposed, the soul will continue to undergo the reward or the punishment until the day of judgment. Body is decomposed and decay, nothing remains but the last piece of the vertebra. Then on the day of resurrection, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reassemble the bodies and the soul will be instilled again into the bodies and we will be resurrected and gathered as we are being alive today. Barakallah feek. Second question. Death is a gift to the believer. 
explain what it means. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam <coughs> said in a couple of hadith, one of them said, Ad-dunya sijnu al-mu'min wa jannatu al-kafir. The life of this world is a prison, like a prison for the believer. And for the non-believer, it is paradise. Why is it like a prison for the believer? Because what Allah has prepared for him is the actual delight. So once he gets rid of this hard time and tests and trials, then he will go to a better place. No comparison. While for the non-believer, he enjoys, they enjoy their lives, there is no halal and haram. Before we take a tablet or a cab of multivitamins, we ask, does it have gelatin? Why? Because it could be from pork sources or swine uh, skin and bones. So what? We can eat it. It's haram. So even with the medication, alcohol, uh, a cough syrup, does it have alcohol? No, sorry, I cannot take it. Why? Because it has alcohol. You grab a shower and a sandwich. Is it halal? You trust these guys. Why? Because you're concerned about everything in your life. You know, very a lot of conditions, a lot of restrictions, like a prison. But an unbeliever, you see them lining up, hundreds of them, before a nightclub, once it is the weekend. Like the time they should take a break to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't care what to wear, what to eat. They do as they wish. So for them, it's a jannah. But for the believer, it's halal and haram. And the dunya is like a prison. And when they go there, the actual jannah. They get free. They are incarcerated in this dunya so long as they're living. And once the soul, as I just mentioned the previous hadith, or a part of it, they go straight to heaven. Now, when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said in another hadith, <coughs> when somebody died, mustarihun aw mustarahun minha. Those who die are either one of two. There is no third. Either mustarih, this is the one whom you're referring to. Mustarih now, he will experience comfort. Khalas, no more pain, no more softening, no more offering the prayer on time, halal and haram. It's over. Now it's time for reward. The other category is the evil one whom the rest of the creatures other than the human beings will feel better, better or even the human beings will feel better that this wicked person have died. Khalas. Then he's going to an eternal turmoil. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of the first category. Allahumma amin. Now, and I will not be able to take any further questions. I need to wrap up this uh, hadith, insha'Allah. <coughs> the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not act like politicians today. He paid attention to everyone who, the ummah, including a woman. When the, when the Sahabi said a black woman, there is nothing wrong to say that she is a black woman. But at this time, and in many places nowadays, they perceive the dark complexion as inferior to the white race. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never distinguished between people based on their color or complexion or gender. A woman, most of the hadith says that she's a woman. And she used to come for the sake of Allah, pick up the pebbles and the stones and sweep them, clean up the masjid. So one day Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not her absence, she's not there. He said, what happened to her? He said, Ya Rasulullah, she died yesterday and we buried her. He was very angry. He said, Halla adhan tumuni? Why didn't you tell me? You should have informed me. But Ya Rasulullah, you're a busy man. We've done whatever we can do. Alhamdulillah, we buried her. We offer salatul janaza. No big deal. He said, no. Dulluni ala qabriha. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doesn't know the unseen. He's a human being. He doesn't know the future. For those who say that he have an access to know the unseen, why didn't he just go to the grave if he knows? No, it's in Medina. In Baqiyah, a few steps from Al Masjid. He said, Show me where is her grave, which grave is hers. Then he took his companions and he demonstrated the true meaning of equality and who is actually superior before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah. <coughs> Excuse me. Then he lined up and he prayed another janazah before her grave. How to pray the janazah on a dead person if he did not? 
catch or attend the first or the second funeral prayer or you were abroad and you came late. Some people say, keep my mother until I come back for three days. It's an honor for the believer to be buried as soon as possible, day or night. Bury him or her. Then whoever comes, go to the grave, stand before the grave facing the Qibla because you're praying to Allah, not to the grave. You're making dua for her, not to her. Okay? Then the Prophet ﷺ lined up and the companions prayed. And those who prayed before had prayed again with him, the honor of Jama'ah. And the Nabi ﷺ led Salatul Jinazah for this woman. A man and a woman can just simply clean the masjid whenever they want to. And this is one of the greatest deeds. I know one of the great shiukh, when the people would surround him, tens of thousands of whom. And once he starts feeling something in his heart, like, you know, how much people love him and gives you a sense of superiority, he pulled over <coughs> at one place. He saw a masjid on the highway. He got off and he went straight to the bathroom and he started sweeping and cleaning the bathrooms with his bare hands. Why? So that he would humble himself. This is me. This is an honor for the believer to clean up the masjid. When I shared this hadith, with our fellow Muslims in our community in Victoria, Texas. For years, alhamdulillah, and I'm a witness to that, we said we cannot let non-Muslims, you know, a non-Muslim maid, come and clean up the masjid and vacuum the masjid and the bathroom. And it was an honor for us. We had the best surgeon in town, an anesthesiologist, um, you know, oncologist, people in, in the medical field, whom in order to, to, uh, you know, to go to their clinic, there is a long queue. It takes a couple months for some people. But we used to compete with each other. Who's going to clean up the masjid and who's going to do this and prepare for Ramadan? So we learn from the Prophet Sallallahu how to behave towards the masajid. It is not by spending money in order to create the masjid from inside and nobody shows up. Nobody attends. La. Then hire a non-Muslim to manage the facility, the premises. No, it's an honor for me to clean up a place in which people worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it shows us how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was very keen to explain to his companions that this woman, as in some narrations, I have seen her in Jannah. Because of this, what you used to think, what you guys used to think, that it's a little deed, cleaning up the masjid. It led her straight to Al-Jannah. Never ever belittle any of the good deeds. Never undermine or belittle any of the believers, even your maids or servants before Allah, they could be superior to you. Just humble yourself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah the Almighty teach us what we don't know and help us and guide us to do what is best. Pardon us and forgive us our sins and give shifa to all the sick Muslims. Ameen. Aqulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. حبيب الله رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he only humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him only humans to be the best and give his best religion to them. So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about him in paradise, worshipping cows, fire and stones, selling the best with the cheapest price. So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise, worshipping cows, fire and stones. Selling their best with the cheapest price.